I'm James M. Ray, the um, kind of leader of an anarchy called the Libertarian Party Energy from Thorium Caucus. And we ab actually advocate not just thorium, but nuclear fission in general, because it's so great. And we have very few assets, but one of them is this cartoon board. I'm probably showing it wrong. No, I mean, it looks good. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. everybody everybody sees me post this cartoon all the time. When the caption says, science tip, log scales are for quitters who can't find enough paper to make their point properly. And it shows the energy density of uranium, which is 76 million, versus sugar, which is 19, coal, which is 24, fat, which is 39, and even gasoline, which is only 46. And 76 million is such a huge number, even 1 million is such a huge number compared to 70, you know, or, you know, compared to less than 100, that people's minds don't even get how good of a deal nuclear is for prosperity, for humanity's future, if you actually like this species, which some days I'm not so sure about. <laughs> but anyway, what I wanted to ask you is exactly what your background in nuclear, because it's probably much more than mine. I'm a troll who watches videos, so. Yeah, well, you know, you're doing better than most. At least you're educating yourself and you've got some uh, a handle on, I guess, the, the power of nuclear power or are we going up Kaler? No, of nuclear power or, or, or nuclear fusion, you know, when we finally oh, figure fusion. out how to do that. I mean, so, fusion, this is fission. A fusion is going to be yeah. an even better deal than this graph graphic. Yeah, it's an even yeah. better deal. <laughs> and, you know, whenever I think fusion, I always think back to the future when he's throwing a banana peel in, in the Mr. Reactor <laughs> so that, you know, he can keep going kind of thing. And at some point it, it may just get to that and, you know, when we get to thorium, it, it kind of is that way as far as I'm concerned. But me and my background, I, I've got qu quite a varied background. Um, when I was in the Navy, I was Navy nuclear power. I graduated the uh, uh, machinist made A school, which means I get to work in the engine room. And I graduated with a 90 plus percent uh, average. And then when I got to nuclear school, I graduated in top half of my class. And when I got to a nuclear power prototype in, uh, in Idaho, uh, I graduated the upper, upper half of my class there too. So as far as theory goes, when it comes to a uh, uranium high pressure reactor, I kind of got that figured out. And it, it is really interesting. Well, from there, uh, after I got out of the Navy, I uh, kind of wandered around a while, worked as a machinist. And, you know, that, that's the one thing that always kind of uh, made me laugh when I was in college. Uh, I'd be sitting in mechanical engineering classes, and I'd look around and I could see that half of the kids in the class didn't know how to change the oil in their car and never had done so. And I'm like, what are you doing thinking you're going to be a mechanical engineer without ever turning a wrench? You know, so... That, that, that's something that, that I enjoy getting. You know, I, I got my mechanical engineering degree from the University of Minnesota. And there's a quick story I can tell you with that. In my senior lab, I went, out, um, I went to power and propulsion. When you get to a certain point, there's different ways you can go within a mechanical engineering degree. And, and I went power propulsion because that's what I love. You know, gas engines, nuclear power, all that fun stuff. And in the senior lab, by the way, those are the only classes I never skipped. I love going to that class because I always would, I got old Chris Craft Boats and I never knew why I was supposed to change the oil all the time, but I learned in that class because those engines run so low that water condenses directly out of combustion products, gets entrained in the oil and you got no filters, so you got to change it. Simple, but something people don't think about. So anyways, my senior lab, I sat in front of not only my instructor, but the guy, K Kittleson, who wrote the book that they still taught with in the 90s about internal combustion engines. He wrote it in the 50s. He sat in to grade my lab. And what I had done, it, it was a fun lab. And I, I was older than most people at that point because I'd been through the Navy. I even brought my son to class a couple of times, been married and all that. So I, I was, don't want to say as little above these guys, but I had more experience. And when it came to our senior lab, final one, we got to choose what we wanted to do. And I looked at the guys and I said, this is so simple. Let's just change the viscosity of oil, right? 
Simple. Change the oil, look at the power curve, see, see how the oil affects the power. Great. So we did that and went through it. And when I got to my senior lab, I took from our final lab a 3D concept and applied it to our project. And I had not only my instructor, but the guy who wrote the book in the 50s look at me and they asked me, how come something happens on the 3D curve? And I didn't have the answer, but they did because of the change of temperature. But they looked at me and said, we've never seen anyone put this together before. So I felt really good about myself at that point that I was able to take their concept and apply it. Well, after college, I worked at Honeywell for a while on the JDAM project, Joint Direct Ammunitions. That's where I worked on the vibration isolator for the inertial measurement unit that had three accelerometers and three laser gyros in it. And when they dropped the bomb, it could make a B B1 bomber eight miles away over the local shopping center eight miles high, hit every single house on this point with 16 yeah. bombs. You yeah, know, that, that, really good at bombing people. <laughs> yes, we, yes, we are. And that, that was back in the 90s. I, I can only imagine how good it is now. Okay. How much better does it have to get? This well, is and, crazy stuff. And, and, One thing and, governments can always find money for is to modernize nuclear weapons. And I'm like, wait yep. a minute, Putin, your 1970s nuclear weapons scared the shit out of me. Modernized versions of those can't scare any more shit out of me than the shit that's already been scared out of me. Well, and, and that's just it. You know, the young kids don't realize what it was like for us growing up. Duck and cover. You had drills where you'd go hide behind the locker and all this silly stuff. But that was a part of life back then was nuclear holocaust. It's not anymore. And, and it's just like a video game to them these days. And but like you said, imagine if we took that... See, do you think about Go it? Ahead. I still think about it. I, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm really glad we're not doing this. And I have a feeling that I don't know if you want to call them aliens, but some sort of creatures seem to be sometimes kind of pranksterizing our and pro probably other countries nuclear weapons to keep them from working, you know, in weird yeah. ways. But that that gets into aliens and we don't want to go there. Not in this. No, no, no. But still, well, we, we, we may just not right now. Yeah, there's, there's weird things, though, about our nuclear history that I don't get or I, I barely got. Like in high school, my first contact with thorium and the, the molten salt reactor idea was the idea of a nuclear jet plane, a nuclear powered jet yep, plane. I remember that. The Navy had gotten submarines and gone under the North Pole, and the Air Force was like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> We're the Air Force. We we got to have nuclear power on something, too. That's so right. Even if it's crazy, you know, and Weinberg was a genius. He, he thought this was a crazy idea, but he was like, wait a minute. I'll take that research money for molten salt reactors. No problem. <laughs> and sure. so that's our history, you know, is the, the weirdness of, of how nuclear is. Um, in... In the Navy, did you ever experience problems with your reactor at all that were that are ones they talk about in my long videos, like the the xenon stuff and all that? Not that I know of. Uh, you know, the, the the only problems they had with the reactors on the Enterprise were they were too big. And when they ended up retrofitting them after they went through their useful life, they downgraded the size to sixty percent or original. And the, the biggest reason they did that was the enterprise could outrun everybody else. And as a carrier, you have a task force around you, okay? Then there's no <laughs> sense at being able to have that power to outrun your task force who can't even keep up with you. So, <laughs> you know, it was unique, but they found that, that there was just so much power, so much power in the nuclear reactors that, 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 I mean, that the ship used to be able to do 65 miles an hour. I mean, a, a, a hundred ninety thousand ton aircraft carrier. That's amazing. Were you? Did you ever take it up to that speed? Uh, I'm not sure if we ever hit sixty or sixty-five. Uh, I'm sure we hit fifty a time or two. One coming back from the Indian Ocean uh, on a seven-month uh, cruise, where the captain came over and said, "Well, there's a typhoon coming, and we aren't really worried about our escorts, so we got a choice." We can hang out and be with the typhoon or we can open it up and go. So we opened it up and left everybody behind. <laughs> and so the rest of the Navy got to experience a wonderful typhoon is what you're saying. The little ship that bounced around everywhere. Right? <laughs> oh, that's the way it was. We, we'd string stuff over from other ships and they would be wave crashing and wave crashing. And here's the Enterprise. Just right through it. 
<laughs> I mean, that thing was a beast. I actually walked under the thing in dry dock. Could you imagine walking under an aircraft carrier in dry dock? That is pretty awesome. I, I hope you trusted whatever was holding it up. I'm guessing. Uh, I had uh, 2,500 stanchions. Okay. They, they, there were a very good number of them. And the interesting thing was they actually had them all properly placed because the hull isn't just flat. You know, it changes as it goes. And they, they when we came in, they were all in the right spot. Interesting. So, yeah, well, we had to go under there and inspect the intake vents, intake crates for the seawater and that kind of thing for our plants. But we had four nuclear plants on the Enterprise. Each had two reactors. So we had eight reactors, each capable of powering the city of Honolulu through its ship service turbine generators if we needed to. So even if seven of the eight reactors went down, the ship would probably be all right, right? Uh, it would be on a limited ability, but yes, it would still be operational. I mean, you guys must have had, okay, the, the Navy experiences that I heard about were from World War II veterans and Vietnam War veterans. And what they talked about was the concept of a Navy shower. And I still do this actually in Florida because I, I save water and it's a long story. I'm an environmentalist. But anyway, you get in the shower and you, you get yourself wet and then you turn off the water and you soap up. And then you rinse off the soap and you get your yourself clean and you don't use a lot of water like normal people do. But presumably in a ship like the Enterprise, you could waste water all day and nobody would give a shit, right? There were no knobs in the showers. It was a pull ever, you know, it, it kind of came, it came out hot and warm kind of deal. But, you know, it, it wasn't so much that it, it was more. Yes, it, there was plenty of power to do whatever we needed to, but it, you didn't want to overuse or abuse anything. And we felt bad enough just throwing our garbage into the ocean as we tootled around that, <laughs> you know, you did what you could to, to minimize. Plus, you know, if you're in a fresh shower, all that stuff has to go through the, uh, because it wasn't seawater we showered in, it was fresh water, mm -hmm. but all that stuff had to go through the condensers. You know, so it was making the fresh water that was more of the issue because the more water you put through the condensers, the more junk you would have, the more they get gummed up, the more maintenance they would need. All oh, that kind so of stuff. it was salt or something, whatever, whatever salt, gunk, gunk up. brine, whatever's in the sea, whatever microscopic wildlife comes in, whatever it might be. Yeah, one of the things that upsets me here in Florida, and a lot of things upset me here in Florida, is that the um the manatees are all dying and they're dying because the government has basically through policy and other things killed all the seagrasses, which is what they eat. And one of the things that manatees like in the winter is warm water, which they can get. And it's totally unnatural at places like Turkey point. And even yeah. at non like non-nuclear uh, reactor power plants have a warm water discharge because uh, they waste power. Yeah. Anyway, the, the manatees are having a lot of trouble this year and just a lot of trouble in general. And I'm a fan of them because, oh God, I don't know why I'm a fan of the manatees. Yeah. I just am. You know, they're one of the nice things about Florida. And so I'm, I've been talking to Flower, Florida Power and Light, which has been ignoring me. And one of the things that I learned, I also talked to the manatee bureaucrats, is that it's apparently no longer legal to do what Turkey Point does as far as with um, the cooling water or whatever, the, the warm water discharge, the, the, the heat itself has been determined by the EPA to be pollution. And okay, in an ideal world where we weren't screwing up the manatees, yes, it would be pollution. We're not in an ideal world. We've messed up the manatees environment totally. And this energy, this heat, these are mammals. This is what they need. I mean, if you've ever been cold, you know it's it's an uncomfortable feeling. And these are our fellow mammals, and we have totally ruined their seagrass anyway. And now EPA bureaucrats are saying that even if FPL did what I want them to do, and they're not doing it, by the way, <laughs> but even if FPL did what they what I want them to do and built the two new light water reactors they have permission to build at Turkey Point. Even if that happened, they couldn't actually do the warm water for the manatees that's happening. And right now, the cooling canals at FPL are like this unexpected, 
unanticipated environmentalist miracle with not just manatees in them, but with the Florida saltwater crocodile in them. And our crocodiles, like everything in Florida, they're like a wimpy version of the of the Aust Australian kind of crocodile where this crocodile is not really going to attack you unless you really fuck up. But it's a it's an incredible crocodile. And the, they're reproducing in FPL's territory. And the EPA is saying, hey, don't do this anymore. And I'm like, oh, you're supposed to be the environmentalists. You're, you're supposed to be on my side with this. Uh, well, drives, you know, it drives it, me crazy, but this especially. It, it's to the point where people think too much. OK, we've yeah. got too many people going through college thinking too much about certain things. I mean, they're really complaining about heat in Florida. <laughs> I mean, come on now. Florida well, gets hot. It's, it's some hot water, but these are these are nice looking cooling canals. I mean, I want to go there. Okay. I've seen like NBC News went there and stuff. And um, pardon me, I'm making a drink. Um That's fine. I've, I've seen their I've seen their facility, the, the area, and I want to go there in person with Florida LP politicians, Mike Termott. Martha Bueno, um, Joe Hanush, and who's the other one? Shit, wait a minute, I'm not thinking. M Dennis, Ms. J Dennis, whatever his last name is. Um, anyway, we have actually politicians for once in our party this time who are not embarrassing. <laughs> and they're all behind me, more or less. Uh, you well, know, well, it's, it's hard to get behind what you're doing. You know, th there's a statistic I've known for a long time. And I'll ask you this and see if you know it. How much uranium would it take to power the average person's lifetime in the United States, volume-wise? I think like a baseball? Uh, a pop can. Okay. A beer can. Let's, 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 let's say a beer can. Okay. That's not a lot. Okay. That, that's a small amount of material. But then when you get to what you're talking about, thorium, which is much more abundant, which is like everywhere, all of a sudden, you can start realizing how simple it would be to solve the other problems if we drove ourselves towards these nuclear solutions instead of away from them. You know, and one thing I've always thought, especially, I mean, for a long, long time, I watched years ago on Discovery Channel where they took a big container they used on trains to transport nuclear waste, and they wanted to see what, what it would take to wreck the thing. So they blew it up. Then, happened. then they took it up 100 yards in the air and dropped it. Dunk, da dunk, dunk, dunk. It bounced around. Nothing happened. Finally, they left it on a railroad track and hit it with a high speed locomotive. Boing, it went flying, bounced around. They could not hurt the thing. No matter how hard they tried, they could not damage it, which is great because that's kind of the whole point, right? Nuclear waste and shit. And that's you know, there are some times in life where it's worth spending the money. Well, do you know where do you know where I think we should spend the money? I think we should stop bombing other countries for a year. Let's just take one year off, stop bombing other countries. Let's take that money and let's build ourselves a magnetic rail somewhere out near the mountains that can go nice and flat and curve up. By the time it's released, it's already at escape velocity, and that thing's gone towards the sun. And then you never that's, see it again. That's an interesting idea. I saw this idea, and it's from the 1950s, before I was even born. And it was from the Russians, actually, rather than um, us, for once. And it was this idea that now I've heard a lot about. I mean, from there's, there's various smart people that think we should do this, that is a... A uh, graphite, they didn't have this technology in the 50s, but a graphite um, carbon fiber, basically a, a rail all the way to space. And supposedly, well, we space could, elevator. Yeah, we could launch, or not even launch, but lift things up to space without all the, you know, without punching a hole in the ozone, without oh, yeah. spending a lot of energy. I mean, once you, and once you got something up there, apparently it might also function as kind of an, 
energy antenna for some of the um for some of the energy from from ionizing radiation from the sun and all that that i don't understand it nearly enough i mean oh, th I, there's so much you could do if, if we did, if we if we did a space elevator you you'd have to put up high you know some sort of asteroid space station type thing to anchor it so that it's you know goes around the earth just right all the time mm -hmm. but you could also use that you could put other things out in space to collect energy and direct microwaves to this thing which could run energy back down to earth yes yeah, so there's know. all kinds of solutions like that that can happen absolutely but but what do you think if we just started it's not even blasting off our nuclear waste it's using a mag rail magnetic rail to accelerate it to escape velocity and then it's gone that's a good idea, and, and people have thought of, about throwing it into the sun for a while. My idea to get rid of a lot of nuclear, not just waste, but weapons, and this is somewhat controversial, so it's not the Thorium Caucus that's saying this is just James M. Ray, but I'm one of those people that wants to nuke Mars because we need Mars to have both an atmosphere and a magnetic field to retain the atmosphere. And the USA and probably other countries have the kind of nukes that can do an electromagnetic pulse. And what we could do is send a bunch of big nukes and a, at least one Elon Musk boring device to Mars and then bore a hole in Mars, nuke the center of Mars, and then set off one of those specialized magnetic pulse nukes to give it a magnetic field, and then nuke the hell out of the surface and send all kinds of whatever asteroids we can possibly find at the pl planet. And the bottom line would be Mars gets an atmosphere and we get rid of all our nuclear weapons because I mean, mankind wants to blow things up. I'm convinced. You know? Yeah. Oh, Just yeah. getting rid of nukes, you know, won't won't satisfy us. But the idea of blowing shit up on Mars, the only downside I see is that it would wreck our beautiful robots and the Chinese robot, which I like. I like our robots. And so I don't want to do that. But everything else about it seems like a great idea. And just sending a man to Mars when it doesn't have an atmosphere isn't that interesting. We've got to terraform it first, in my opinion. Have, have you heard of the book series red red mars uh green mars blue mars no you've got to get all three books and read them very very interesting that this author was very creative and understood physics and how things work and he basically goes through the terraforming of mars from the first people who get there to set up a base and encapsulate it to protect everybody from the radiation and then uh and then they try to start to warm the planet up to free the water and all that. And through this whole series, they do things like get a hold of asteroids, ones laden with water, and mm -hmm. aim them at the atmosphere so they'll break up and dump a bunch of water on the it's it's a great series. Red and Mars. The comet Mars. is a comet is just a big watery asteroid with a for big... the most part. You know, there's other stuff in them too. Yeah. It, you know, it all depends on the comet and the composition of it, just, just like any asteroid, you know. All this gold hunting we do, destroying the earth down here, you know, it drives me nuts, kind of, because I like watching Gold Rush, but those people are strip mining everything. Why is it bad in West Virginia and it's not bad in Alaska? I, I just don't get what, where are the environmentalists for that. But, you know, there's an asteroid from what I understand out there that's got more gold than's ever been found in earth before. Yeah, it's and more platinum too. First. Yeah, that platinum. thing is full of gold, platinum, palladium, and um, what it, um, yeah. silver. I mean, it, it probably has a lot of silver. It would just be the perfect asteroid for the super greedy dude like me. And it's out there, and <laughs> people are kind of not even paying attention. But it, it is interesting to think about those kinds of asteroids and abundance and the kind of abundance that we could have, the metals abundance that you think of. What, what I always think about with abundance is what I did with it before I. I had it. And I think you're old enough to, like me, to remember when long distance minutes were a big thing. Okay. Oh, yeah. Rollover and, minutes. Well, and when I was four years old or three years old, the thing I loved most was talking to my grandmother. And uh, all my, my other two brothers also liked this, and my parents liked this, but, you know, we couldn't we weren't made of money and still aren't, we couldn't afford to pay AT&T or whatever they were back then, the bell system, that much money. And so I had very limited amounts of time to talk to grandmother who I love and still love dearly. And now she's passed away. And now 
the same in the same body i i'm famous for falling asleep on zoom calls where five minutes of that zoom call probably consumes more bandwidth than i used in the entire first half of the 1960s <laughs> yeah oh yeah it's abundance that i mean what i did with abundance i i squandered it by falling asleep but you know presumably i want to give away abundance to other other people you know i'm not well, that and, a person <laughs> right and you know that's what nuclear power can do it's not nearly as dangerous as people think you know when i was in we all had a little dosimeter we kept on our belt and we'd go and we put it in the thing and we'd see the little reading that would come out that would tell us how much radiation we got for that month or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was never really an issue. And it was, it was really interesting when I first got to the ship that they were in Huntington Point or Hunter's Point in San Francisco uh, because the idiots in charge hit the biggest rock in the Pacific Ocean off the coast and put a huge gash in the ship. I guess everybody's ankles were sore from walking like this for a couple of days after they after they hit that but they got into dry dock and, and they were fixing it up and i and i got out to the ship but there were actually nuclear protesters there and it was really kind of interesting you know because i get it nuclear protesting you want to be safe and it is scary okay i understand it is scary for uneducated people i get that but you had these people sitting there with their hands all twined together and all that they had paddled around into a secured military base okay it wasn't even the regular this is a super secure base and they paddled in there and they had these old radiacs that would go off if you pointed them at the wall you know or pointed them anywhere and they go look at our radiacs and it, it was actually quite comical because it, it was a bunch of hysteria driven nonsense and these people all got to go to jail for the night over it you know but they thought they were doing something but i'll tell you they didn't do anything because heck you really think you're going to get the navy to change no well now now people are you know I, i've already said the words aliens now now people are going to really think i'm batshit insane because i'm going to i'm going to bring up radiation hormesis it turns out in my opinion that the low the a little tiny dose of radiation the same radiation that would be dangerous in large doses might actually not just be non-dangerous but might actually be good for you and the re the reason i say this is all kinds of experiences weird experiences <clears throat> they've had with people like the people who were not far who were far enough away not to get killed at hiroshima and nagasaki the people who were in this building were some genius in Taiwan got the, the great idea of using cobalt 60 to make cobalt steel and built a skyscraper with radioactive steel. I mean, all kinds of other, you know, radiation experiments that would not be ethical if you did them deliberately on humans have indicated that there is more of an interesting thing than the linear no dose threshold, which says that basically any radiation is bad for you, even the smallest amount, which I think is terrible. And I wish comedians who are funnier than me could make fun of it better because it's, it's well, a th concept. Th that's not what they taught us when oh, I was in the yeah. Navy. Not even close. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, a uh, uh, hundred rads is going to kill you. Ten rads is very bad for you. But you know what? Ten rads spread over this many days is meaningless to you. Okay, so it, it's not a dosage issue. It's a dosage over time issue. Yeah. Low dosage over time is not bad for anybody. You know what? We live with that. It comes out of our faucets. It's around the ground in us. It's everywhere. Your bananas that you eat have potassium-40, and apparently if they extract potassium-40, and somebody else has told me this, and just use the potassium-39, that first of all, the banana probably tastes horrible after you did this, but <laughs> it's not as good for you. And those those big kind of Brazil nuts, you know, the biggest nuts in yep. the nut thing, those are apparently super radioactive for whatever reason. I mean, there's, there's certain plants and mushrooms that will pull up radiation at at high rates and you know i eat the brazil nuts first <laughs> you know so nobody else gets them <laughs> sure sure you know and it, radiation just like you know what carbon dioxide is a scary thing let's just compare radiation to carbon dioxide 
both can kill you if the concentrations are too high. Mm-hmm. Okay, if the concentrations are fine, then you're fine. That's the way it is. Our bodies have learned to adapt. You know what? They use radiation as therapy on people. Yeah, you know, all the time. But that's to to kill things. I mean, they're they're not quite to the point that ancient man was at it in a way where they treat naturally radioactive springs as a place that's healthful but throughout history in all sorts of places mankind has done that and treated these places as very healthy even though there's no real great scientific data well you have to be careful about that there's a lake in uh i don't want to say ukraine but but over in the former soviet socialist republic in the southern area where they had detonated a bomb and it filled up as a lake and they encouraged every they made beaches encourage everybody in town to swim there and it just happened to turn out that everybody there had super high cancer rates and everything so that goes back to what i said earlier it was a bomb. moderate dosage is fine mm-hmm. okay a it's bomb the over, and unfortunately they they the, the, the russians were experimenting on these people is what no different than the u.s when, when my dad worked downtown in minneapolis they, they, they would let chemicals go off the tall buildings to experiment on the population and see what would happen you go ahead and search and find chemical real release mm-hmm. minneapolis you'll find they even did elementary schools and okay, they've done so, that with biological stuff too yeah. where they had no idea what the hell was going on and i can't believe the government when they do this but then i look back you know and like the history of alcohol prohibition let's leave leave aside my weed okay but alcohol prohibition they would deliberately poison alcohol to kill people because alcohol wasn't unsafe enough it's ridiculous exactly exactly you know and, and that's the thing there's far too much trust in our government mm-hmm. far too much now, I know people want to say, well, you can't trust big corporations. Well, what's the biggest corporation? <laughs> the Federal Reserve. <laughs> the government. You know, when, yeah. I grew up in, when I grew up in Minnesota, the three biggest employers were General Mills, Pillsbury, and, uh, and uh, uh, 3M. 3M. Yeah, 3M. yeah. Right? Which is a great company, by the way. I, I'm yeah. a huge fan of 3M. I, oh, yeah. You know, uh, I'm not a fan of everything corporate, but my God, they've done some great shit. <laughs> sure, sure. But th- those were the three biggest. You know what the three biggest employers are now in Minnesota? Uh, Federal government, state government, and local governments. Oh, God. It's like, okay. it, it, it's, it's over. You know, we're, we're never going to win unless we take it back. And, and that goes to this stuff too. All the freaking regulations that go in with nuclear power. I get it. You hmm. want to be safe? But come on now, we've got to make this viable, especially if you really are concerned about the environment. Yes. No way. There's no way in hell. And I know what I'm talking about. I've been running a green energy company. I sell micro wind, wind, uh, solar power, battery banks. I I deal with all of that. And and I don't do it because I think it's the right thing to do that we're going to save the planet. I think you do it because it's right for a lot of people you want to protect your future and and, and, you know potentially there's a lot of places it's just not viable to get electricity and stuff otherwise so everything has its place and and, you know yes big wind turbines have their place absolutely it's tremendous to harvest the wind so do big solar farms so they keep killing birds plants. and bats. I'm just too much of a fan of birds and bats, especially bats, to to like the wind turb- turbines and most. Well, well, the problem with the big wind turbines is they just don't look up and see the damn blades. You know, birds look down; they don't look up to see danger. And so, when they're looking down, flying around, it, you know, boom! This is what ends up happening: is they end up getting wiped out, and it's not the right thing, but. You know, maybe you strategically locate them, you know, offshore, whatever, you know, you find places, but there's places for all of this stuff, geothermal and everything else. We 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 have to do a combination. Oh, I'm I'm not against energy in any way because I like, you know, air conditioning, basically. Willis Carrier made my state habitable, but the only good thing I can see for wind would be maybe inside a city where buildings kind of direct the wind reliably to produce a certain 
effect. Well, but I've had there's idea. certain areas, and you're absolutely right. Now, now, what you want then are the micro wind turbines that I sell. These things don't have bird kills because they're not too big. They're round units that spin around. They're oh, they're those critters those can all see them. them. Oh wow! Well, give your business. Oh, no, they're upside down egg beaters. Give give your business a plug. Uh, go Green Energy. Go energyonline.com is my website, YouTube channel. Those of your watches, the turbine guy. I've got over 7,000 subscribers now, so that's growing. A lot of green yeah. energy, a lot of libertarianism, and and a lot of my cats and other animals on my site. But, well, well you know, hey, you know what? We just discovered or realized we have the oldest cat in Minnesota. Oh, she's really? 20, 22 or 23 years old. We're going to oh, call wow. the vet on Monday. Yeah, but I mean, she Take just some pictures, man. She's the, still internet going. Needs to, uh, the internet needs this cat. And by the way, all cats should get fresh catnip. That stuff they sell in the pet stores is floor sweepings, I tell you, floor sweepings. And by the way, I mean, I don't know how I can tell you this, but cats have told me reliably that catnip buds are better than just plain catnip leaves. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm sure, but. Problem is, whenever I've gotten a fresh catnip, I get to clean up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> comes chaos. My my cat, I I gave her some catnip in this paper bag. I you know, put up a whole bunch of it, and then she just went in there, and, and, and then like five minutes later, you know, the the bag is peaceful. And five minutes later, she breaks out of the bottom of the bag. <laughs> goes oh. around the room. <laughs> I mean, I was I was paralyzed from laughing, man. Um, well, it sounds like you've got a great business now. Say that say that URL again. Uh, go Green Energy Online dot com. Okay. I know it's a little long, but that's what it is. Go Green Energy was taken, but Go Green Energy Online dot com, or you can follow find me on youtube the turbine guy you know something i've coined lately and i've actually paid my money and i'm getting the trademark on something something you might be interested in really interested it's called the green pill it's a libertarian answer to all this eco justice warrior stuff going on and it includes all the different alternatives including nuclear power you know, it's about the government getting out of the way, decreasing regulations and giving people the opportunity to do what they want to, to go green or to do other things, you know? And like I said, to, to me, you really want to solve that. You want to stop burning a lot of coal and stop doing a lot of other stuff. You're never, ever going to do it without nuclear power because you're never, ever going to yeah. have enough storage capacity in order in order to power what people want to do so then the next best alternative is nuclear power there's just no question about that and you know from when i was in the navy from the 50s well hell the first military reactor exploded so i'm sure do, do you know the story how, how come uh, it's called a scram in a nuclear reactor I don't know that, but I know that one guy got impaled by control rods, which sounds like a horrible death. <laughs> but tell me about the scram. Yeah, we got to watch a video when I was in the military. It, scram stands for safety control rod axe man. Safety, because literally when they did the first reactor, they had all these control rods in it and they had it all tied to a rope and they could pull the rope up and rope up and tie it off and see what happened and they had a guy standing there with an axe if there's an issue chop the rope let it fall and we'll be okay <laughs> well they were wrong okay and that's when they got impaled the guy on top of the reactor with the axe who was supposed to chop it got impaled in the ceiling with the control rod when it exploded there's there's a whole soap opera story about that may have been deliberate and there's a conspiracy about somebody sleeping with someone else's wife and all kinds of stuff and you know in the military of course infidelity can get you um canned you know it's it's oh, it, yeah. it's it's frowned upon in society anyway but in, in the military it's especially frowned upon and yeah. so there's this story about that and i i just read it and i don't know whether whether to believe it or not but um 
I, I posted it. I think I posted it in the energy from Thorium Caucus because I'll post anything there just about if it's <laughs> related, you know, but you should join sure. that definitely. And I, and I yeah. love all the people there and the Libertarian Party is what you make it is what, what one of my, I think my friend Nick Sarwark said that and to make it more pro nuclear, I have to just be the change that I want. And, you know, my caucus has no money. And so I've got to do things like, you know, scam mentions on other people's shows like yours. But I'm going to save this video if I can find this video and give it to you for your YouTube channel. And I hope it's good for your YouTube channel. And oh, um, yeah. I, want to, I want to give you the floor for the any final words that you have uh, or about anything, anything you wanted to say, um, anything we need to do in the Thorium Caucus. You know, the floor is yours, man. Well, that's cool. I appreciate it. You know, it's all about education. You know, it's really funny when, when I'm running around talking to a lot of these Democrats in Minnesota and they talk about how we're all for green energy and they start talking about Trump bad. Now, I'm not a Trump supporter, OK, but when they start talking about him bad, I just look at him and say, well, you know, I have to work on facts and facts are that Obama let the renewable energy tax credits expire. Trump re-upped them and then Trump re-upped them before Biden got in. So the only reason that the renewable energy industry got back into business was because of Trump. It wasn't the Democrats. They're all talk and no action. Okay? <laughs> That's the issue when it comes to this too. We have to get beyond beyond the fear and hysteria over nuclear power and we have to have honest education so people can understand that yes there is nuclear waste you know what else there's oil waste there's natural gas waste you know hydrogen everybody oh hydrogen is going to save the world well you know what it would if you were out in space and you had a hydrogen collector on your ship but not here it takes a lot of energy to make hydrogen OK, that nothing's for free. And that's what people don't understand. And if it's going to be at the point that nothing's for free, let's start choosing the best options and start being honest about this, 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 this whole discussion. Let's find a real way to deal with the issues we have instead of pointing fingers. And let's move forward and solve these problems. Like I said, wouldn't it be great if we didn't drop bombs on anybody for a year and just figured out how to deal with nuclear waste? Just one year. We can drop bombs on someone next year. Okay, that's fine. Your waste anyway. You burn it. I mean, there, there's, there's a an hour and forty six minute long video that I that I can post for people if they want in the caucus. It's been posted a couple of times about you know, bur the nuclear waste isn't really waste. It's something you can burn. But one of the things that I didn't mention that I should because I mention it all the time is that coal has more thorium and uranium contaminating it than the you get from the power you you get from burning coal okay the, sure. and coal is actually a crappy source of those yep. things what a good source is as it turns out is florida beach sand and yep. we don't even need sources of that but the florida beach sand has the black monazite ore you think of the florida sand as white and it is but about five percent of it or so is black if you're playing around in it and looking at it closely and it's this really fine black sand that's kind of a little bit heavier i guess than the other sand but it's there and it's among all of our sand and on all of our beaches, you can go find it, you know, just next time you're at a beach, look for the fine black sand. I think that's the monazite. And that's just naturally occurring stuff. It's slightly radioactive. You don't have to worry about it any more than you have to worry about bananas or Brazil nuts or any of this other stuff. And um, it's been great to talk to you, sir. Oh, and Kyle is a hero, okay? He has helped the Thorium Caucus so much because... I mean, I can't do all this stuff alone, you know, and he has been so supportive and so great. So thank, thank you to the, to the, to the whole Nygaard family. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kaler, you mean Kaler. K. Yep. Kaler. K-A-H-L-E-R. That's my son. Yeah, that's my I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, 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 I'm uh, me, me too. Unless I meet you three or four times, you know, it just doesn't register. I, I get it. Yeah. You know, that this has been a fun discussion. It's fun to point everyone else. Uh, uh, what? Just a final quick statement that, you know, 
everyone has to look at their own needs. And how do you fill your own needs? And that's what libertarianism is about, is filling your own needs. And, and, and that's why I'm here. Uh, I, I'm, I went to see Adam Kokish out in uh, Arizona and brought him a wind turbine. It's what he needed, you, oh. you know? Maybe By the way, did you know that Adam's in, in the in a jail? He's in, uh, <laughs> Apparently, yes, he is in, he jail is in the who's mushrooms. Um, this yeah. is bad. We're against this, of course. You know, um, I I want him to get out. He at this point wants the cops to apologize to him. The cops, yeah, were good luck. Out brutal and all that. But I'm like, yeah, Adam, just get out, dude. But you know, I love these guys. I love you. I love everybody. And our our caucus is growing because I'm trying to be totally welcoming to all of the libertarians. And so, thank you for so much for being on this show. Sure. Assuming that I can get the video of what we just did, I'm going to send it to you. Assuming I can figure out how to send it. <laughs> okay, so no, that'd be great. That'd be great. Hey, you know what? It's been a great talk. We should probably do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. And um, in Reno, let's ha let's have a shot. If you're if you get to Reno, if anybody gets to Reno, anybody in the Thorium Caucus gets a shot. Yeah, I agree. All right. Talk to you later.